Hey, thanks everybody. Uh, my name's Rocky. This is Chad. Uh, we're really happy to be here with you. Uh, this coveted right after lunch on the last day of the conference slot. Um, <laughs> Chad and I are both front-end developers at um, Kleckner.i in, over in Berlin. You heard a bit about that yesterday. We're sponsoring this conference. Um, Kleckner's been using Ember for a long time, and we're big fans, so we're really excited. Um, <clears throat> what we do is we help work to digitize the steel industry, which isn't particularly um, sexy or innovative. Um, but we build, we build the Ember apps to replace some of the tedious manual processes that people go through every day. Uh, in turn, it makes the, the lives of those users dramatically easier. So these are people who are used to pen and paper, telephones, fax machines even, um, and we're giving them these tools that save them tons of time. It really changes their workflow, and they really, really appreciate what we're doing. So that gives us a great sense of satisfaction to build things maybe that aren't on the cutting edge, but with cutting edge tools and happy users. Um, if you'd like to know more about what we do or how we're involved in the community back in Berlin, um, come talk to us, ask us anything. We're happy to answer your questions. And it's, you heard yesterday multiple, multiple times, and from everyone else here that's sponsoring, we are looking for developers. Uh, well, Chad and I first met uh, years ago in Portland, Oregon. We both ended up working with Ember um, at different companies there and taking part in the awesome community <clears throat> that exists. Uh, as you know, um, Tilda, the company that started, uh, Tom Dale and Yehuda, th that was their company. They moved up from San Francisco to Portland. And so we were right in the middle of, of a lot of the groundbreaking stuff that was happening. Um, we both got to speak at some of the meetups. It was really fun. <clears throat> and now, coincidentally, we both moved to Berlin about the same time and ended up working for the same place. And so it's really cool. We get to be part of the Ember community in Berlin, participate in the meetups. Um, and now we're presenting this topic to you together. And we're really happy to be part of the European Ember community um, and to get to share some of our experiences with you. <clears throat> so let's dive into uh, why we decided to try GraphQL at all. Um, and I, first I wanna emphasize, this isn't a talk about GraphQL being superior to any other technology. It's not a five reasons why you should switch to GraphQL today kind of presentation. Uh, it may not be, you may not want to use it at all. But what we want you to take away um, is a good sense of what it is, what problems it can solve, and some confidence that if you do want to use it, that you could do that uh, comfortably get started. <clears throat> At Clickner, we're really fortunate uh, to have the freedom to experiment and try out new technologies. Uh, so that gives us opportunities to dive into something new. Uh, the first time I saw GraphQL, I immediately wanted to try it. To me, just on the surface, it looked like a better way to wrangle data from your API. I really liked, <clears throat> I really liked the paradigm shift away from the RESTful model. <clears throat> but really, the real catalyst for us to give it a try uh, was that we were, it came time to build some new apps, some new services. We had some issues with JSON API, uh, and it seemed like a great time to try something different. At the same time, we also started to build some apps with Phoenix. We had been using Rails, so it was a big, like, let's try out some new technology kind of time. <clears throat> but <clears throat> I want to highlight some of the issues that we had with JSON API. Um, after that, then we'll cover some GraphQL basics, um, and then we'll provide some examples implementing GraphQL and Ember apps and discussing some acceptance testing techniques. Um, if you use <clears throat> Ember data, you're likely familiar with the uh, JSON API spec for building APIs. Uh, it offers a pretty low resistance path to working in number data and is designed that way. Uh, in my own experience, uh, JSON API really does save you tons of time with API design and it gives your team a, whole, a huge boost in productivity over some kind of wild west API design or some other spec that doesn't have as many features. Uh, but that being said, it's not without some pain points, and we want to point some of those out that, from our own experience. Yours might be maybe different. Um, one, um, I'll skip the details of CRUD and JSON API, assuming that mostly you're all familiar. But what I do want to highlight is that it doesn't cover everything that you need. Not everything fits into the, the model. Um, I'll use a real world example from one of our own um, applications that involves a shopping cart. Right, to perform a checkout in this app, 
um, our front end updates a cart record. Uh, in other words, it sends a, a patch request to the server with some attributes for the cart, and uh, we introduce some side effects on the back end that put that cart into a different state. And now it becomes checked out. But the code looks like this. Um, we're just updating a cart, right? And, and this matches what we're doing, but in reality, behind the scenes, something else is happening. <clears throat> I'm 100% sure that we could do this, we could write this in a way that's more obvious to the person who's reading the code, what's happening, but somebody has to do the work that makes it more, more clear, whether I name this, the name of this, um, that this action is different. If I change the name of this action to check out the cart or something like that, you still somewhere the code will get a little confusing. Um, and with GraphQL, as, and we'll get into it a little bit later, we can write mutations that describe exactly what we're doing. Here, this is what a GraphQL mutation would look like. And <clears throat> you can see it just says perform checkout. So it's, it, here the developer knows what this is for, what it's doing, and we're outside of the, the CRUD model now. <clears throat> On another note, um, JSON API uh, is, is only a specification. As Ember developers, we're really, really lucky that we have Ember data. It does a, so much work for us. It's an amazing tool if you're using it. <clears throat> but for your back-end developers, if you're a full-stack developer um, if you're, and you're working on the back-end, uh, it's not so easy. Right? <clears throat> it's only as practical for you as its best implementation, and a lot of those are lacking. Libraries can be difficult to work with, um, or some of them don't exist for some platforms. And some of, our, some of our developers have said to us that they think that that could be due to some of the design of the spec itself. But in any case, dealing with complexities um, of the spec that aren't handled by any library can have some major drawbacks. Uh, at worst, we've actually offloaded functionality to the front end because Ember data can deal with complex relationships and things that we need better than the back end could. And obviously this is not ideal to move it to the client side. <clears throat> but at other times it's caused a lot of frustration. Some of our developers writing a lot of custom code to deal with parts of the specification that are really complex that some library doesn't deal with. Um, and this is, it, it's really bad when what you're trying to do is actually just a simple task and you end up shoehorning a lot of things into the constraints of the spec or the, or the CRUD model that it doesn't want to fit in there. Um, when it relates to GraphQL, um, it lags behind in a few areas, but what's really cool is that the JSON API people are really working toward making it better. They, they take things from other, <clears throat> other ideas from other places and they say, how can we implement some of these things so that our tool can be better? And I think that's really awesome. But Yehuda opened this, um, this issue on GitHub to track some of the, the deficiencies, and he really did, he like perfectly summarized some of the things that we've experienced. <clears throat> he covers um, API exploration out of the box, and a built-in way to describe types, or in other words, having a schema. And I see Ember developers really gravitate toward these points that he made, um, and I can see why. These things, in real life, they have a gigantic impact on your productivity. It's, am it's amazing how much faster you can work <laughs> when you have these tools. But um, his first two points that he made about being able to um, query deep queries for uh, related records and having some kind of really flexible mutations, these actually really impact the code you write. So <laughs> I'll show you some examples of this later on when we talk about implementations. I want to quote one of our developers. He said, oh, when using GraphQL, I don't feel like I need to bend it to my needs like JSON API. I, and I agree with him. I think this is a really nice summation of our overall experience. Like I got the same feedback from just about everybody who's worked on all these projects. <clears throat> and uh, I think it's true. Sometimes um, you do have to, you have a feature, it's not too complex, or maybe it's very complex, and you have to fit it into a, the model, uh, the JSON API model, or whatever whatever model you happen to be using, uh, whatever constraints are there, and GraphQL has um, some extreme flexibility, so it's, it's, it's kind of nice. We'll touch on this a little bit later. But for now, I'm gonna hand things over to Chad, and he's gonna give us a little intro into GraphQL itself before we get into the implementations. Cool, thanks Rocky. Um, just by a show of hands, who here has already 
use GraphQL, even like a sample app. Okay, so that's good, maybe like 20, 30%. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm gonna go over uh, some of the basics of GraphQL. Um, so to get started, let's just start with the word GraphQL. Let's throw out the graph part, and what we're left with is QL, which stands for query language. And a query language is described as a language that requests and retrieves data. So you can imagine GraphQL as being a language for requesting and retrieving data from your API. So not so complicated. So before we can retrieve data, we first need to request it, right? So let's, make, let's take a look at what a GraphQL query looks like. So in this example, let's uh, pretend we're online shopping and we wanna get our cart, we wanna get all of the uh, items in the cart, we wanna get the description and the price, and we wanna get the total amount. Now, you might already get the sense just by looking at this query, it reads quite naturally. Um, and we're just describing the specific data that we want. So that's, it actually reads very, very simply. Um, so now looking at the response for that query, it looks like this. It's uh, coming back in a JSON format, and you'll also notice that the response mirrors the same shape as the request. So the indentation of the response is pretty much the exact same as the request, which makes it quite natural when you're comparing what you're asking for and what you're getting. Now, you might already, already be getting the sense that this is quite flexible, right? So what else can we do? Well, the query language also supports arguments. Um, arguments are defined on fields by our schema. And in this example, we've added a page argument to our items field, and this lets us do something simple like paginate through items uh, in our shopping cart. And you could do this at different places in your schema uh, if you've defined it in, uh, sorry, you can do that, this in different places in your query if it's defined by your schema. But also, of course, we don't wanna hard code this number two for the page, so we also have variables. Uh, you can define variables at the top of your query, and then you can use them anywhere inside. So in this example, we are defining a, uh, the page variable that is a number that we're going to pass into the page argument, and now we have a lot more flexibility. So at some point, uh, as Rocky alluded, you're going to want to change data. So for this in GraphQL, we call this a mutation. Mutations are a lot like queries, but you're explicitly saying, like, something's changing here. There's some sort of side effect. Um, it's not just a, a read-only uh, operation. Um, and in this case, we have a update cart address mutation. Uh, you can see exactly what it takes. Uh, it has a cart, and then it's gonna take an address, so that for each item in your cart, you can update with an address. So I feel like when you read it, it reads quite easily, and it's very descriptive. So we've looked at a lot of the querying parts of GraphQL. Let's just take a moment now and talk about what is this graph part in GraphQL. So when you think about the graph, I want you to think about connections. Connections exist everywhere in our data, and they will evolve and grow organically, much like a city, streets, subway lines. A lot of these things aren't planned, but they do grow organically. So to, to define these connections between our data, we use a schema. Why is this awesome? Because you can see the connections between the fields and their types. It's both descriptive and self-documenting. And thanks to introspection queries, we have the ability to see that underlying schema that us as developers and our tools um, can use at any time. That video didn't play, so uh, it'll be in the post after. <laughs> um, so GraphQL has a lot more language features, and this isn't specifically a GraphQL talk, so I don't wanna sit here and just go feature by feature. It's all documented very well. Um, but if you could remember a couple things, just remember that GraphQL is a language for requesting and retrieving data from your API, and that is made easier thanks to the fact that it is typed and backed by a well-documented schema. So to get more into the guts of how we can uh, implement this with Ember, I'm gonna hand it back to Rocky. Um, so first, let's talk about some, some clients uh, that we can use in our Ember apps, and um, then after that, we'll cover some common code base examples, well, some code base examples from, from our own code bases. I don't, you might not have the same, same thing. So. After we tried out a few clients, we ultimately settled on Apollo, 
Uh, Apollo itself is a large-scale GraphQL platform. It spans the client side, the server side, uh, middleware, right? <clears throat> but uh, we're just concerned about the client side. And there's um, a really excellent add-on called Ember Apollo Client, and it makes working with, um, with the Apollo uh, tool set really easy. Um, we recommend this one, because it does have quite a few features that you might want, um, and the, the examples that we're going to use uh, will show the usage. Um, the add-on docs, though, are really nice. Uh, they give you some testing examples. Uh, and they also show you how to do some things like authorization with um, Ember Simple Auth, for example. Uh, in addition to Apollo, the first, we, the first client we tried worked with Ember Data. Um, we didn't choose this one, but uh, it was appealing at first because uh, we were trying it in an existing Ember app where I had Ember Data. Um, and the only thing that we had to do to get it set up was to add um, a new adapter and a new serializer without any custom code, just including them, um, and it worked. But um, as we, we got better at GraphQL and understanding more of what it does and how to use it and the GraphQL services were improving, uh, it ended up being too inflexible for what we needed. Uh, it also limited some of the functionality, the flexibility that GraphQL gives you um, out of the box, and we didn't think it would work at scale. Here's some lightweight clients, um, Loca and GraphQL request. We won't cover these in the talk, um, but we do have an example repo uh, that shows each one of these clients working in there. Um, Chad created that. There's a link to this repo in a blog post that we created to go along with this talk. So we'll show you that, we'll share that with you, and you can check out the repo. <clears throat> Next. Um, I want to cover some of these common, common patterns. They exist in our code bases, maybe not yours, but hopefully you can abstract uh, the good parts. We're going to use the example of a shopping cart. Uh, it's very similar to one of the ones that we have in our own apps. Um, the shopping cart has um, line items because our clients, our customers, can have carts filled with tens and tens of items. Um, and we want to paginate them. Uh, in addition, well, they, can, they can edit. The, the line items, including like the shipping address, things like that. We'll get into that uh, in a little bit. But how might we load some of the data, um, some of those nested cart items with Ember Data? Um, you actually can. It's not that hard. Um, you can even you can even do some deep relationship uh, fetching with this. But you don't get any control over the related data that you get, and maybe you would want that. Um, and so it, it's nice to be able to sort and paginate these things. This is lining up with one of the deep querying things that Yehuda brought up. To do that, uh, we end up with code that looks something like this. Um, it works, but it's starting to get pretty messy. Uh, first, what we do is we go and we fetch the cart, right? We may not know what this cart record is, so we query for it. Okay, so we've made a network request. We waited for that. Now we have the cart ID, and we can use that as a filter to load line items, okay, we can still include line item addresses and things like that, but it's getting a bit weird, and um, now we're changing the data structure a little bit of the model. This cart and cart items are siblings. It's not a big deal, but it's a little odd. But we can get the same data by writing this GraphQL query. Um, it should be pretty obvious, the structure here, right? Uh, we're going to get a cart. The cart has items. Those items have an address. They have their own fields. Right? And you can see some of the variables that we pass in here that line up with the query parameters for pagin uh, paginating and sorting. And this is how our model code would change in this scenario. Um, <clears throat> we would just call, make the one query, pass in the variables we need, and then we would get back. We would get back the data that matches the query structure. Um, some of the things I like about this in no particular order. Uh, we have a lot of control over the data that we get. Right? Um, we can query for fewer fields than exist in the model. Um, this is something you can also do with Ember Data, but JSON API allows this, and it's really, the URLs get really, really weird. Um, we have less model code, and it's a little bit easier to read. I think it's, it's a little bit more, uh, makes a little bit more sense for me at first glance. Uh, we reduce the network request in this case, but in a lot of cases, the network request thing isn't a big deal. Um, and the data structure is kind of in the same way that we expect. Now, for mutations, um, we talked a little bit. I showed you the slide with the cart on it. But uh, let's expand this a little. And this is real world, right? Our users, they can edit the shipping address for any item in their cart, or they can bulk update them. Right? And this is where things get a little interesting um, with Ember Data. 
uh, it's that latter case, that bulk update that we want to take a look at. Um, so these are some current, some current constraints here that we're dealing with. Um, both Ember Data and JSON API, they want to operate on one record at a time. Um, I just heard, thanks to Ed Faulkner, that um, the JSON API spec now includes operations, which should allow for some bulk updating, but Ember Data still doesn't do this. So things are coming. It, it will be nice. Um, this slide will be stale and useless. Um, so how could we do this, though? We did this with Ember Data. We didn't have GraphQL the whole time, so how did we do this? Well, we, uh, we updated the cart items individually. Uh, so we write code like this. Right? And you may not write some code like this, but this is what we did. Um, we would get all the items from the store that we wanted to update, um, and we would update the attributes, then save them, and we're, where it would get a little funny is when things went wrong. Right? Then, then you have to make some interesting decisions. Right? Do I roll back the attributes in my Ember, for these records in my Ember data store? Um, how do I show some messaging to the user? It, do I leave? My client state is now out of sync with the server state. How do I deal with this? It gets pretty interesting. Uh, and we wrote some code that I don't really like that, uh, that deals with these problems. I'd rather not deal with them. <clears throat> with uh, GraphQL, your mutations are extremely flexible. They aren't bound to anything. Right? You don't have to have a record to do anything with it. Uh, you can kind of use your imagination. Uh, you can update one record, or many records, or many different types of records in any way you'd like with a single mutation. Um, you shouldn't do that, but you can. <clears throat> and it's not anything goes. You can't just arbitrarily query for something or mutate something with GraphQL. It has to be defined as, as a part of your schema. You can't change some attribute of some record, even if you know it exists, if the schema doesn't allow for it. So it's, there's some safety there. <clears throat> And this is, what, this is what the code would look like um, in this action that we're, we're talking about. Um, you can see we didn't actually make any changes to the objects that are in our store. Um, and we, we didn't have to load all the records to do this. Right? One of the problems with the previous example was if they're paginated and you want to change them, you have to go load them. And if there are many, this is, a, this is kind of cumbersome. And it's kind of hard to let the user know what's going on. And it's kind of hard to ensure stability. Um, but in this case, what we're doing is we're just, we're changing. We're in a different paradigm. We're not saying, here's a record and some attributes to change. We're just saying to the server, here's a message that says, hey, for all these items for this cart, change the address to this. So it's, it's, it's a different paradigm. Um, and uh, since we didn't update any of the records in our store, if anything was bound to the view, our user interface doesn't get out of sync. Now, Again, you don't have to follow this pattern. Maybe you don't want this. But for us, for in our code bases, this is what we want, and we like this. Um, so to recap that, um, the mutations are extremely flexible. You can do just about anything with them, but uh, you can't just do whatever you want. Data flow is more unidirectional. I like that. I don't know if you would. But uh, I think it makes the, UAT, the user experience a little bit more stable for us. Um, you can be very irresponsible. Um, but that just doesn't really happen. Um, because you create exactly what you need, you do. Um, and everybody kind of benefits from you know, working on the feature that you need instead of kind of trying to you know, cram something into a model that doesn't really match the use case. Anyway, so next up, Chad will give us some, uh, some quick tips, techniques on how to uh, do some acceptance testing with GraphQL. All right, so we've kind of gone over GraphQL, we've integrated it with Ember, now we're at a point where we still have tests, right? So before we jump into GraphQL testing, let's just take a look at kind of a typical testing scenario that we have uh, with a regular application using REST. So on a regular application using REST, you're going to need to make separate requests for separate resources on separate endpoints. And if you're an Ember developer, you might be using uh, Ember CLI Mirage to do this. So behind the scenes, Mirage is uh, using Pretender.js to capture those requests in your acceptance test, pass them over to handlers that have access to uh, factories and an in-memory database, and this has worked out quite well for the, uh, the Ember community. Now things are a little bit different with GraphQL, right? Because now we have batched all of that request for separate resources into one query, and we're hitting a single endpoint. That means that you have to be able to unpack that request and understand what's in it. 
and it's not encoded in the URL, and it's not encoded uh, in the parameters, it's encoded in a query, which is essentially just a string. So we saw a few talks yesterday about ASTs and all that kind of stuff. So you can imagine, like, to understand what's in a query to be able to mock that request is actually kind of an interesting problem. So um, another interesting thing about GraphQL is that you have this case where because everything is batched into a, a single query for multiple uh, resources, you actually have a lot less uh, requests overall. So like Marco said, uh, if you can avoid requests or no request is uh, the best request to make. So at Cloakner, we actually um, did have a test suite that was using Mirage. Uh, we already had our factory set up, we had our handler set up, and we didn't want to throw all that work away. So we came up with an add-on called Ember CLI Mirage GraphQL. Makes uh, sense in terms of its name. And what this add-on does is it provides a handler that you can use to map on the graph endpoint from your GraphQL schema to your Mirage schema. And this works quite well, and hopefully uh, it will give you a lot of wins right out of the box. Um, it's still in development, so give it a try, take a look, and we would love to have uh, some contributions. Uh, another technique that you can use in this particular use case is um, especially works if you have a real API that covers your test cases. So you have an, a real API that's, um, that would handle, yeah, the majority of your test cases. For this, you can use PolyJS from Netflix. Uh, it, it was released just a few months ago, so it's relatively new. Um, it's pretty interesting. If you're familiar with Ruby, it's very similar to the VCR gem. Um, and it's not specific to GraphQL. You could actually use this with any APIs. So that makes it like, an interesting tool to consider outside of GraphQL, but also especially for GraphQL. So with Poly, um, all you need to do is run your tests once with a real API running in the background. And what Poly is going to do, it's going to sit in the middle and intercept those requests. And it's going to record the request and the response. Um, and this is great because the next time you run those tests, you don't need that API running. Poly is going to intercept those requests and match it against the recorded response. So you're getting that replay of the exact same uh, result, which is uh, pretty cool, especially when you have something like uh, a query that's been baked into a request. You don't necessarily have to understand the request, but Poly will do the work to match it. So you're still going to get the same, uh, the same response. Lastly, maybe there's a particular use case where uh, there's a very custom way you want to handle the response or it's um, yeah, something that's more of an edge case. In this case, thanks to Ember Auto Import, we can just import other NPM packages quite easily now. So you can uh, tackle this problem by importing Pretender.js, like we saw with Mirage doing behind the scenes. So you'd capture that GraphQL request and pass over the request data to another package called GraphQL Tools. And what GraphQL Tools is going to do is it's going to unpack that request data, uh, do all the AST stuff so you don't have to worry about it, and you are able to have custom mock resolvers, which are just functions, so you can resolve that data yourself. Um, so this is ultimately is very flexible because you can handle specific parts of your query uh, in a custom way, but uh, it leaves a lot of the wiring up to you. There's no you know, Ember install to just take care of this for you. So uh, keep that in mind, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting way of solving this particular problem. So now I'm gonna invite Rocky back on to just kind of summarize our experience and uh, wrap it up. Real quick, just to recap our experience, it's been really, really nice. Um, when we have this easy to explore schema in our hands, we know everything we can and we can't do with our API uh, without having to consult documentation or in, you know, in a common case, ask the guy next to you, like, hey, how does the backend work? Uh, you don't have to do that. Um, it really increases productivity. Um, <clears throat> and I think the flexibility allows us to really create an API that makes more sense. Right? Like we, we talked about earlier in a couple of examples, sometimes when you're fitting something into the, that CRUD model, it doesn't actually match what you're trying to do in the real world. And it gets, can get very confusing. And so sometimes you have tribal knowledge or you have to you know, really read some documentation to understand the full effect uh, of the thing that you're doing. But in this case, we don't do that. Um, you don't have to shorn anything into it. Um, and you, you really do 
you just build what you need. I, you can get you can get crazy with it, but in my experience, all the developers are very responsible, and everybody is building something streamlined. They're all enjoying it. Um, also, the data flow changes have really improved our user experience. We said before, you might prefer that optimistic UI approach, of, right? Updating records on the client side before the server side. I, this doesn't apply to our applications, but it could in some applications in the future. So it's something that we have to consider. Um, and the thing really is, though, that you have the flexibility to deal with it. You can, you can choose how you want to, to deal with these things. So that's a nice, a nice benefit for us. But anyway, thank you very much for the time. We appreciate being here and getting a chance to share with you. We've turned this talk into a blog post because I personally don't like looking at, at slides. Um, so there's a lot more content in the blog posts. It's, you, can, you can read into it quite a bit more. But of course, if you'd like to talk to us, please do in person or find us on Discord here. Or uh, you can find Chad on Twitter, but, but not me. <laughs> Thanks.